It is uh, now time for question time. I call for the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. Questions, uh, I must inform the Chamber, questions 1, 6, 12 and 15 have been withdrawn. Ms. Claire Sugden is not in her place. Uh, I call Ms. Claire Sugden. Question 2. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service is not reliant on using private ambulance services. Private ambulance providers are only used in exceptional circumstances, such as those that arose during the recent periods of industrial action on the 13th of March and from the 27th of April to the 10th of May. The use of the private ambulance services on these occasions was under the NIAS Resource Escalation Plan to support the ambulance service and uh, their resources. The private ambulance services were engaged primarily to deal with non-emergency calls in order to protect capacity for uh, Northern Ireland Ambulance Service staff to be deployed in response to 999 calls. From Ms. Sugden for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, given um, the the recent news reports of increased pressures on uh, public services um, ambulances, mm -hmm. is the minister any plans to to leave that, and what are they? Well, there. There have been a, um, uh, obviously issues uh, which have been highlighted by the recent industrial action, um, which have um, been dealt with, as I'm confident that the escalation plans that are in place in the Trust are, are, are appropriate to deal with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, at this minute in time, there are roughly 90, this is 94, I think, um, vacancies within the ambulance service. Many of those posts have been for, for, paramed uh, for emergency medical technicians. Um, around 90 of these positions have been offered to ambulance care attendants, uh, and it would be my hope that um, with the filling of those vacancies, uh, that could help to alleviate some of the pressures which manifest themselves, as I say, during the recent uh, industrial action, but can be also be seen in intervening periods as well whenever there is pressure on existing resources. And, uh, many, uh, many constituents of mine and indeed many constituents of members of this assembly will have reported difficulties in terms of slowness perhaps sometimes in the response times that the ambulance service does. So I hope that in, in, in moving to fill those vacancies that that might in itself help to address some of those particular pressures. Call Mr George Robinson. Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, would the Minister state how has the number of paramedics working in the health service in Northern Ireland changed over recent years? Uh, Mr. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the number of, of paramedics, if you go back to the, the beginning of the current assembly terms, you go back to roughly March, the end of March uh, 2011, the number of paramedics employed within the ambulance service in Northern Ireland was 379. If you fast forward then to March of this year, to March of 2015, that number has risen, and even though I, I pointed out to um, Ms. Sugden the, the vacancies that, that exist, which we're trying to, to fill, um, there are currently 415 paramedics, and that includes 80 uh, rapid response uh, vehicle paramedics as well. So in that four-year period, so from between 2011 and 2015, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, there has been a 9.4% increase in the, the number of paramedics. And I think that's something to be, to be warmly welcomed, and I appreciate that even with that additional complement, there are still pressures on the service, that there can still be sometimes difficulties with the service, but I think it, it is testimony to the work of, of my predecessors in post that even at a time whenever resources have been under severe pressure, as we all know, uh, Deputy Speaker, that investments have been made in the front line, and the ambulance service is a front line service. Our paramedics and our, our care attendants are incredibly important to the overall service, so a near 10 per cent increase in the number of Northern Ireland's ambulance service paramedics over that period of time, I think is testimony to the commitment that we have made to the front line in that period. Call Mr. John Dunnett. Mr. For his answer, uh, could I preface my question by paying tribute to the ambulance service, certainly in the northern and western areas? And would the minister agree with me that when someone makes that 999 call? they expect a response. Given that there are 94 vacancies, would the minister agree with me that that in itself is an emergency? Yeah, yeah the, the, I, I agree, and I, I join with, uh, it was remiss of me not to do so earlier, but I, I join with 
Mr. Dallet and paying tribute to the work that our, our staff in the ambulance service do on all of our, our behalves. Um, and you know, I think that our citizens should expect the highest standard of service from them as they should from all of our health and, and, and social care sector. And I pre appreciate that there are uh, issues in, in response times, which I'm sort of familiarising myself with, as you can imagine, over the last uh, number of days. And unfortunately, sometimes some of those targets, uh, particularly the target for response uh, to life-threatening calls, so the Category A calls, as they're called, so those that are life-threatening situations, the eight-minute response time isn't, unfortunately, being met. And that's in spite of that investment that I outlined to Mr. Robinson in terms of increasing the number uh, of paramedics that we, that we have. Um, and I think we can all appreciate the range of, of pressures that there are, and that's why, to go back to the original question asked by Ms. Sugden, we, we are able to use, thankfully, uh, other private pr providers, uh, other charitable providers, like of the St. John's Ambulance, the Order of Malta, Red Cross, for example, to help alleviate some of the pressure that there is placed on the so, so that um, our ambulance service staff can be dealing with those particularly life-threatening calls and those emergency situations, so that whenever, unfortunately, somebody has to, to make the call, that they are getting responded to appropriately and in the appropriate time. And we know that when they do get responded to, they, they get the best of care. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Um, in terms of the adequacy of uh, ambulance provision, would the Minister uh, undertake to look again at the question of provision of air ambulance services in light of the events on Saturday at the North West 200 where a spectator had to be airlifted to hospital? And can he comment on the fact that though the severe trauma unit is at the Royal Victoria Hospital, there is no facility to land a helicopter at that hospital, adding further to the delay in the transporting of severely uh, injured uh, personnel to the hospital? Yeah, I think the, the member is right to raise the particular incident at, at the weekend. It once again highlights this issue of, of our ambulance provision uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think we were all shocked by the, the severity of the, uh, the incident that took place at the North West 200, and I think there were uh, pictures in the press today which showed just how, how serious a situation it was. Uh, and we pay tribute to all of the staff who responded to that, and, and, uh, and we, uh, our, our thoughts are obviously with the, those who are, are still in hospital uh, and are being cared for, and, and we wish them a, a speedy recovery. Um, the Health and Social Care Board, Mr. Deputy Speaker, our princi uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, has submitted a report to my department on the feasibility and the appropriateness of establishing a dedicated helicopter emergency medical service uh, in Northern Ireland. And I'm currently awaiting the report of the Emergency Aero Medical Support Service Group, which um, was established by the Republic of Ireland's Department of Health to consider the provision of a dedicated uh, service uh, in that jurisdiction. Uh, and that will include recommendations, I imagine, in relation to the, the potential for expansion of the geographical reach of that service to include uh, the whole of the island. Uh, when the report is received, I'm going to consider those recommendations in conjunction with the Health and Social Care Board study before making a, a final decision on the matter. But Mr. Alistair is also right to, to point out one of the, I suppose, practical difficulties there is in respect of provision of our ambulances. I don't think anybody would dispute that in the circumstances where we had appropriate resources, that it would be a good thing to do either on our own or in conjunction with our, our neighbours to the south. Um, however, that will require not just investment in a helicopter, um, but it will require investment in staff and maintenance and upkeep, but also in those infrastructural changes to ensure that there is an appropriate place to land the helicopter, and that is obviously one of the reasons why at this stage, even if we had our ambulance in place, it wouldn't necessarily be working to its optimum. So there are a lot of points to consider. It's something that is on the agenda, and the events of the weekend uh, highlight it all the more. Call Mr. Ross Hussey. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses so far. I like Mr. Dallet, I'd like to pay tribute to the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service. Unfortunately, I had the misfortune of having to travel recently in an ambulance with my late mother to the Southwestern Acute Hospital, and the, the paramedics that dealt with my mother were excellent, and I pay tribute to them. Does the Minister know how much compulsory overtime uh, ambulance drivers and paramedics currently have to undertake because of the short number, the 98 or whatever it was number that we are short of paramedics at the minute? I, I don't as the, the simple answer, but I'm happy to pr provide that to, to the member in, in due course. Um, I think it's worth pointing out, I think Ms. Sugden's question is a, a, a useful question in highlighting uh, the provision that is being provided, Deputy Speaker, by, by others on, um, in support 
of the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service. It's primarily for those non-emergency situations where, where patients are being moved from hospitals, say, back to their home or from, from their home to hospital for, for appointments. Um, so I think that that is, that is worth noting the work that has been done on our behalf by, by other providers. And I think there is an acceptance, I hope there's an acceptance, Deputy Speaker, around the House that it is a, a, a good thing that we're able to, to call upon that resource as, as appropriate. But I don't have the specifics in terms of the, the amount of overtime that is being uh, paid, but I'm happy to provide that to, to the member in due course. Ms. Sandra Overend. Question number three, please. <coughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, the final budget for 15-16 is exceptionally challenging for my department. Indeed, at this stage, even after delivering substantial savings of almost 160 million, some 30 to 40 million pounds of unfunded pressure still remain to be addressed. In addition, there is no funding to invest in a range of new service developments. I'm also fully aware of the difficulties of the overall Northern Ireland financial position and the need to urgently get a resolution to the welfare reform issue. In such a constrained financial context, my department will seek additional funding from the executive through the in-year monitoring processes in order to avoid service consequences and to provide additional services and treatments for patients. I can assure members that if successful additional income from June monitoring would enable me to address a range of critical frontline service pressures in areas such as elective care, mental health, learning disability, specialist drugs, children's services, transforming your care, public health and unscheduled care. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the June monitoring bids are currently being developed for my consideration and in line with normal practice, they will be discussed with the Health Committee prior to final submission. Well, Mrs. Overend for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I also take the opportunity and congratulating the Minister in his new position? Uh, the Minister will, of course, know more than most the uncertainty surrounding the, the monitoring round. Can he detail the most recent estimated funding pressure his department uh, for his department this year, and in particular, what service and what trust is he most concerned for? Uh, can I begin by thanking the member for, for her congratulations? I hope that in, a, in a roughly a year's time she's still able to stand on her feet in this house and congratulate me. Uh, so do I, I think most people do. Um, <laughs> um, the, the, you, the members are, the, the, we, we are facing, I hope I outlined that in my, my initial response, that I'm well aware, Deputy Speaker, of the, the even before taking up this post, I was well aware of the financial pressures that uh, the Department of Health is facing. Uh, and even though I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased, I suppose, and proud of the fact that uh, in my previous post, I was able to uh, ensure a 3.4% uplift in departmental expenditure in the Department of Health this year, which was uh, 203, 204 million pounds, I think, uh, in monetary terms, that that still left considerable pressures and need to realise significant savings from within the budget. And that, and we are committed to, and we, 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 will, uh, we expect to deliver a further £160 million worth of savings through efficiencies throughout their health system uh, in this year. Um, but there, are, there remain roughly £30 to £40 million worth of unfunded pressures within the system. And, and that will be um, spread right across the system. There will be pressures that are being faced in various trusts and, uh, and other services like the public health agency and so forth that we're providing. Um, so that, that is the immediate pressures, Deputy Speaker, that the department faces, which we need to, we need to deal with in year through a range of measures, if that money is not found uh, through the monitoring round process. And I think we're all concerned, obviously, with the, the situation and the standoff around welfare reform. What will happen with the monitoring round process, whether it will be actually a monitoring round process where money will be able to be distributed, or whether the, the, the executive will face further pressures on funding. Um, so, a 30 to 40 million pounds worth of, of unfunded pressures. But there are, that, is, that is before we get into service development. And, and I'm sure everybody in the House now will receive, I'm, I'm certain in this post, requests for service development. So, more spending on uh, mental health and learning disabilities, on, on elective care, and so, so on and so forth. And as things stand at this moment, <coughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm not going to be able to fund those service developments because of the pressures that still exist within the budget. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, but given the Minister's own comments previously in relation to the budgetary spend within health, and, and I think indeed uh, the Chief Medical Officer's comments just today in relation to a very clear need to radically review the system, could I ask the Minister what needs to change? Well, the, the, the health budget is, a, is as, as the, the member and indeed the House knows, by far the biggest budget that the executive has. It's, it's, it's close to half 
of the total budget. It's £4.7 billion in, in total. It's a, it's, a, it's a lot of money. Um, but the, the member, given our position as chair of the county, will appreciate probably more than most um, that when you're spending that volume of money, whilst on, on the face of it you would think that that would be sufficient to provide uh, high, the highest standard of health and social care for a population of, of 1.8 million, uh, we are facing a range of pressures around an ageing and a growing population, uh, the pressure of technological advances and the rise in, in chronic illnesses for just to, just to name three. Um, but we do need to radically review, to use uh, her term or the term she's borrowed from the Chief Medical Officer, uh, if we are to ensure that that investment that this House has voted for, the support that this House has given down through the years and the executive has given to the health budget, if we are to ensure that we are to get the highest standard and the highest safety uh, of, and quality of care for that investment that we are making. And I do believe that we do need to make uh, transformations in the way we deliver the services uh, that our citizens require, and there will be change, and sometimes that change will be uh, require difficult decisions. Uh, and I hope that, uh, and indeed the Chief Medical Officer's comments following on from Sir Liam Donaldson's report, uh, will I hope provoke some conversation around this issue. But I'm pretty, pretty clear in my mind that as we approach the need to, to transform, and I think there has been reasonable consensus across the political spectrum of the need to reform, perhaps not always in the detail of how that for, reform unfolds. But I'm pretty sure in my mind that as we move forward and address the need to transform our health service and our social care system, that we do need to have a, an open and an honest conversation and we need to reach a broad political consensus in this place if we were to make it work. Because it's no good just me coming forward with it and I can uh, preach a mantra about the need for transformation all I want, but if I'm the only person doing it and it's not accepted by others, then we're not going to go too far. Remind the Minister of the two-minute rule. Sir Ian McRae. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I um, join those who have congratulated the Minister um, in, in his new post? And it's gone from calling for those to departments to make efficiency savings to having to do so himself. So it's in that vein, um, what efficiency savings has the department um, managed to achieve in recent years to actually allow the um, minister and his predecessors to actually invest in, in frontline services? I can thank the, the member for, for his congratulations. I, I know, and I know for sure that if I, if I do step out of line, he'll be one of the first that will, will tell me that I have. And can I thank him as well for reminding me. Most people move, um, Deputy Speaker, from a, a poacher to gamekeeper role, but I think I'm more moving from a gamekeeper to, to poacher role in, in the change of office in the last week. Um, the, the savings that have been made uh, across the health system over the last number of years are, are something I think which, which I, I, I was well aware of in my previous role. Um, and I, and I, I can recall various budget debates whenever there was criticism of, of the health service, when there was criticism of inefficiencies within our system, that it was always something that I was very keen to remind the House of the savings and the efficiencies that have been delivered uh, over the last number of years, because I think they're often forgotten about, um, uh, even bread soon forgotten, of course. But the numbers are, are, are I think, quite, quite impressive. So between the 11 and 12 financial year and 13 14 financial year, nearly half a billion pounds, so 490 million pounds worth of savings and efficiencies were, were realised across the health system. Um, we anticipate that in the last financial year, so 14 15, that there will be roughly 170 million pounds worth of additional savings. Uh, and there is a commitment, as I mentioned before, for the, the current financial year, 15 16, to reach a a target of £160 million worth of savings. That's two-thirds of a billion pounds roughly already has been saved, uh, with a, a roughly an estimate of around £800 million, um, by the end of this Assembly term. That's approximately double the savings that were achieved in the last uh, Assembly term. I think it's an impressive record of driving efficiency through the system at a time whenever that system is under uh, considerable pressures. Uh, and I want to ensure, as I'm sure everybody in the House wants to ensure, that. Uh, all that, that 4.7 billion, approximately, that we are investing in the health and social care system in Northern Ireland, that that is providing people with the care that they require and isn't being spent unnecessarily on uh, administration and other aspects of bureaucracy. 
I call Mr. Fargo McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I can I too congratulate the Minister on his new role. Minister, considering that the Transforming Your Care plan was predominantly funded through monitoring rounds, can you update the House on its status in relation to upcoming bids? And could you also detail whether or not the uh, Transforming Your Care plan remains your department's core strategic plan in reforming the delivery of health care from institutional settings to the community? No, I, th I think. Um the short answer to the um, final question from, from the member is, is, is yes, the principles of transforming your, your car remain uh, the priorities for this, this department. Um, and um, I'm aware that um, in his report, Sir Liam Donaldson outlined a, um, one of his recommendations was for a timetable implementation plan of TYC. And, and as the member points out in his first of his several questions that he asked, um, resourcing is a, is a, a factor in, in getting um, TYC, which I, I think, and I know I've heard the, the member criticise TYC in, in this place um, before. Or sorry, so he used to he was against it before he was for it. Uh, so he has been more laterally in support of it, having previously, or his party rather, having previously criticised uh, TYC. But TYC envisaged a, an investment of, of £70 million in the shift left in service provision. Uh, that would release savings of value of, um, to the value of eight, £83 million. Pounds. To date, around £26 uh, million pound has been allocated to TYC initiatives, so it is not that TYC is not moving forward, even if uh, that might be the perception of some. So, integrated care partnerships, for example, all 17 have agreed their action plans and have submitted proposals for service changes. Uh, and the primary care infrastructure is starting to be put in place, so Banbridge, Ballymena, OMA are moving forward, and there is procurement. Uh, process is being taken forward for Newry and Lisburn. So there is a lot of work being done in this. Um, by the end of 15-16, so this financial year, uh, we will have driven a shift left, we anticipate, of, of £45 million. Um, and told, so it is moving forward. It is perhaps moving forward slower than we would like because of resourcing pressures, and that is why uh, one of the bids that I will be putting into the June monitoring round is a bid for funding for transforming your car so that we can continue to realise sort of those, those sorts of of efficiencies, but, but more importantly than merely the efficiencies, the better standard of care that will result. I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Question number four, please. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, since September 2014, the primary percutaneous coronary intervention and PPCI service for patients suffering the most severe form of heart attack is provided to the entire Northern Ireland population from two centres in the Royal Victoria Hospital and Alton Gelvin Hospital. Primary PCI saves lives, reduces complications, speeds recovery and shortens the length of hospital stay. The service has benefited around 1,060 patients in Northern Ireland since its rollout in September 2013. My department has also invested in providing 10 cath labs at four sites in Northern Ireland provided by the Belfast, Southern and Western Trusts. We have also developed a community resuscitation strategy to improve the survival rate for those who suffer an out of hospital cardiac arrest by increasing the available of CPR, availability of CPR training provision and the number of automated external defibrillators across Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Douglas for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far and also offer my best wishes for him and his new role. Um, could I ask the Minister, in terms of um, the, this scheme, it's obviously very um, successful and rolled out across Northern Ireland. And it could just maybe remind us just the numbers of people that actually benefit from this scheme. The, the, I, I think this is um, a. Uh, you remember, it's right to, to acknowledge that, um, or to point out that this has been a, a, a great success for uh, people in Northern Ireland. Um, as I said. Um, Previously, Deputy Speaker, cardiac catheterisation labs are of enormous benefit to patients who, who have a heart attack because they, they can save lives and, and, and they, um, they can reduce complications and speed up recovery and, and significantly shorten the length of, of, of hospital stay to, to the extent where, um, in the past, somebody who had suffered from a heart attack may, be, may expect to be in hospital for a significant number of days or indeed weeks can actually be. Um, um, out of hospital in a number in, a, in, in just a, a few days, um, and so there, I don't have the um, precise numbers of the. Or, or sorry, I think it's around. As I said, it's around 1,000, just over 1,000, 1,060 patients in Northern Ireland who have benefited from this service since its rollout in, in September 2013, and, and I think we should uh, be welcoming, Deputy Speaker, the fact that this 
um, specialisation, a specialist service, which is being done uh, in the sites that I have outlined, um, the, the emergency work being done in, in the Belfast Trust area and up in Alton McElvin as well, is, is proving so successful and, and I think justifies uh, the faith that was put in this service and the investment that was made. Call Mr. Barry McElduff. Can I ask the Minister, either now or in writing, to detail the life-saving life -saving treatments and services which will be available at the new local hospital in Oma following the transfer of services from the Tyrone County Hospital, expected to take place early next year. So just to ask the Minister to detail the life-saving treatments and services that will be available in an area where very many people in a rural setting are uh, very distant from an acute hospital. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, the, um, the member is right in his prediction, and I'll have to provide the information in writing. He has been uh, typically cheeky in slotting in a question about the West Tyrone constituency on a, uh, on a question that was tabled on the issue of coronary care, but I know it's an, an important issue nonetheless, and I'll provide him with sufficient detail um, in, in writing. Well, Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I also welcome the Minister to his new post? And can I ask the Minister to provide an update on what discussions his department has had with regards to education and in incorporating cardiopulmonary resuscitation training to post-primary school children? And does he support the British Heart Foundation as they roll out their free training to schools? Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, the, um, the member will be aware of the publication last year, I think it was in July, yes, July of 2014, of the community resuscitation strategy, which the, the objective of which was to increase the number of people of all ages, so not just adults but young people as well, uh, who would be trained in, in CPR skills. And I'm aware that there is an, uh, it was an event, unfortunately I wasn't able to make it myself, but an event in the Assembly uh, today, um, which was hosted by the British Heart Foundation, which did involve some, some local schools. Um, and they were I think they were also understand they were teaching MLAs how to, to perform CPR. Hopefully, none, none would be required in this place, but you never know when these skills might be, might be very useful. And, and I know that the British Heart, for Heart Foundation are doing that sort of work, which they've highlighted and showcased here today in the Assembly. They've been doing that in, in many schools around Northern Ireland, and I would very much encourage them to do that. Uh, and I think that um, it is the sort of skill that once developed, one will always have. Uh, and I think there is no better setting to do that than to do that in, in, in the school, um, um, particularly with, um, in recent years, so many unfortunate examples of um, those who have been involved in sporting activities having cardiac uh, arrest. It, it, is, it is something that shouldn't be just seen as something for adults to do, but something that can affect young people as well, and therefore training and support uh, where appropriate is, is a good thing to do. Call Ms. Katrina Ruan. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I'd, and I'd just like to add my gorgeous my congratulations to the Minister in his new post, and we look forward to working with him. Kesht um, Ever Akuik, question number five. Deputy Speaker, the lifetime ban on blood donation applies to men who have had sex with men. It is based on sexual behaviour, not sexual orientation. In the case of Geoffrey Leger versus the French Minister, Ministry of Health and the French Blood Service, the European Court of Justice concluded that the permanent deferral from blood donation may be justified in limited circumstances. In Northern Ireland, the judgment in the judicial review case on this matter is, subject, uh, is a subject of an appeal. The Northern Ireland Court of Appeal is aware of the Leger case. The appeal is due to be heard in October. In the meantime, it would not be appropriate to comment uh, in detail on a matter that is before the courts. Ms. Ruan, first supplement. Um, I think it's very important that, uh, and I'm sure this House agrees, that we need to ensure uh, equality for all our communities, including our LGB community. Um, I wonder would the Minister comment on whether he will be moving to lift the ban? Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I, as I tried to point out in, in, in my initial response, the original judgment in this case uh, means that it is not my job to decide this matter is actually jurisdictional responsibility rests with the um, Secretary of State for Health uh, in London. Uh, and that's why, uh, in part why an appeal has been taken to try to establish authority here in the Northern Ireland Assembly and in my hands. And if that appeal is successful and it establishes that I am responsible, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have made it clear so far in post that what guides me and will guide me in this matter is the science and the medical evidence. Because I disagree with um, the member opposite, 
This is not an equality issue. And in fact, I actually agree with the Irish Minister of Health, who, whenever the Leger case was, uh, the judgment was made public, pointed out rightly that this is, this is a matter of patient safety and only of patient safety. And we must ensure that blood, wherever it is coming from, it goes to a patient and it is safe, and they have an assurance that that blood being provided to them is safe. I will, as I said and repeat again, be guided by the science and medical evidence. There is an emerging body of evidence, particularly from Great Britain, around this, and I will monitor that. I will examine that. We'll look at it carefully and take my decisions accordingly. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Cattle Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, a recent report uh, on general practice recommends that we need at least 80 GP training places in place by August of 2015. Would the Minister support this recommendation or would he ensure that there is funding available to cover these training places? For yeah. Mr. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am well aware of. of um, if, I, if I wasn't aware in this job, and I, and I am becoming increasingly aware of, I was obviously uh, lobbied, like many members, by local GP practices around this issue over the last number of months. And I'm, I'm well aware, and I recognise uh, the current challenges that primary care across Northern Ireland faces, and, I, and I'm supportive of the critical role that our GPs provide, and as a, a frontline service to our, our citizens. And, and my department, and I remain committed to working with uh, the British Medical Association and others to identify opportunities to address the current and future challenges that, that primary care faces. And, and by way of our, our commitment uh, to primary care uh, and to the work that GPs do uh, in their surges, surgeries across Northern Ireland, up to £15 million has been invested in primary care this year, in primary care services. That was announced uh, um, at the start of this financial year. And I think that this in investment is a, a clear signal of the vital role, um, the esteem that which we hold GPs, the work that they do, and the vital role that they uh, perform in meeting both current and future needs um, for everyone in Northern Ireland. I call Mr Boylan for a supplementary. Yeah, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, and could I thank the Minister for his answer and, and could I also pass on my regards and wish him well in his new role. Um, and I, do, I do appreciate, Minister, that there has been an investment of 15 million in, in this sector, but would he, would he agree that it falls short of the 33 million that the sector actually needs to bring it up to the same level of standard as in Scotland and Wales? Or well, yeah, I, I think that um, I, I, don't, I don't disagree that. Um, well, I, I'm, glad that, I'm glad that the member has welcomed the £15 million investment. I hope that that is also being welcomed by, by GPs and primary care practitioners and, and themselves. I'm sure it will be, and, and that money is there to help them modernise our services and to um, provide better, better support for, for our community, better care for our communities. Um, you know, I, I would love to have more money to invest in a range of services, but as, as the member will be uh, familiar, um, that is inhibited by. Um, not only the broad general budget situation that we have where our spending as an executive hasn't kept pace uh, with inflation over the last number of years and that's set to continue for at least another two or three years, but also by the fact that this, this assembly is, is losing uh, £2 million a week, £9.5 million a month because of our failure, or not our failure, but the failure of Sinn Féin rather, to move forward on welfare reform. Now, I'm not saying that uh, I would get all of the money, the £114 million that we are paying out in penalties, or my department would have got all of the £100 million that has been lost already because of welfare reform penalties, but I think a department like health, which is the number one, if not if, well, first or second priority of everybody in Northern Ireland in terms of public spending, and has been consistently the priority of uh, the Finance Minister and others within this House, um, wouldn't have received the lion's share of that money. And that money could have been invested not just in primary care, but could have been invested in mental health, could have been invested in transforming your care, could have been invested in a raft of different areas uh, which would have provided much needed care, support and help for people across Northern Ireland. Well, Mr Roy Beggs. <coughs> Tomorrow the Health and Social Care Board is meeting to consider the uh, five proposals from each of the trusts in terms of the future of resi statutory residential care homes. Will the Minister take a fresh look at this issue and will he ensure that the ban on new permanent residents is removed in order that these homes can have some hope for a future uh, and the vital role that they play in our communities? 
Sir, uh, Deputy Speaker, before coming in for uh, the commencement of the previous de debate, I heard the, the member speaking uh, in the prior debate around funding for voluntary and community services. And, and he, he passed comment around, and I can't re remember exactly what he says, but he, he was talking around the difficult decisions that are going to be required in the current environment that, that we are in. And, uh, and this is one such area where difficult decisions may, may be required. Um, okay, I'm, I'm well aware of the, uh, the sensitivities around this, this issue of statutory care homes, but I thank the member for, for raising it because it gives me the opportunity um, to make one particular important point clear. Um, whatever decisions, and, and we will await the outcome of the board meeting tomorrow, but um, it is absolutely critically important that the message that um, Edmund puts when he was in post, reiterated by Jim Wells, and I am happy to affirm again today that no resident of any statutory care home which is earmarked for closure at any point in the future will be moved out of their home against their will. I think it's incredibly important that whenever this debate happens, as it will inevitably happen at some stage in the future, if not in the next number of days, that it is of critical importance that those residents who are in those care homes at this moment in time understand that they will not be moved out of their homes against their will. A lot of things were said in the past that there were unfortunately um, scared people, uh, caused a degree of concern. I accept that the issue wasn't handled well in the past, uh, and I hope that uh, whatever decision the board takes, it will be treated with the sensitivity and respect that it deserves, and that the, that important assurance that I have given, uh, which my predecessors put in place, that no one will be moved out of their home against their will. Uh, will be received, message will be received and understood by, by residents and, and their families. Mr. Beggs for a supplementary. <clears throat> Would the Minister recognise the vital role that such homes play in terms of providing local respite care and also the additional facility that they supported our hospitals during the winter pressures, where otherwise even more elective surgery would have, have had to have been cancelled? And will he actually uh, widen? His, his guarantee to include those such as at Lascarle in the supported living accommodation attached to the Scarl resi statutory residential home who were delivered letters uh, a number of years ago saying that they would have to find a new home. Will he ensure that those residents will be able to live in their supported housing attached to the uh, residential home for as long as they wish to? Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm not, I'm not aware of the, the, the details of the particular case that, that Mr. Beggs raises, but I'm, I'm happy to, to look at it and, and communicate with him on it. Um, I do accept and, and, and the, um, the point that he makes that there is a role for, for statutory care homes in terms of step, down, step up, step down provision uh, and the multifunctional use of, of our care homes. And I think that's an important thing to remember. Uh, and and that, that service will continue to be provided. Uh, but we've got to, to recognise that. Um, patterns of care and, and what actually, more, more importantly, sometimes we, uh, we focus far too much, Deputy Speaker, on the structure itself without concerning ourselves with the service that is meant to be provided. And of course, many of our, many of our citizens want to remain in their homes uh, a lot longer and uh, to live their lives out in, the, in their own uh, properties. And that's something that we want to, that sort of independent living is something that we want to continue to support. Um, and, uh, and of course, as I, as, I, as I said, that this is an issue which is, has caused concern in the past, and I want to see um, whatever decisions are taken by the board in respect of this matter handled with the appropriate sensitivity and care and better uh, than it was handled in the past, mm -hmm. uh, and ensure that everybody understands that, the, and, and, and everybody will reach their, who is affected will reach their, in, their own personal decision in respect of where they want to be, whether they want to uh, remain in a home or move to other um, um, residential care, but they will do that on the basis of their own decision, and no one, not me, not anybody in the board or anybody in the trusts, will be, be telling those people that they should be moving out of their, their homes, because they are their homes, uh, and we will always want to do what is best for those people who are in residential care. Question three has been withdrawn. I call Mr Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I suppose all members of the House will certainly recognise the great job that the uh, the Minister did in his previous role as Minister of Finance and Personnel and the many challenges that he faced. And could I just ask him in his new role as the new Health Minister, what are those key challenges uh, facing him at this particular time? Sir, uh, Deputy Speaker, I don't think I have uh, 
sufficient time in two minutes to outline the, the full extent of the challenges that, that I face in the Department of Health. I, I thought I had a, a hard job until I moved into, into this one. Um, but you know, I think that there are, there are many, many issues, and uh, my first week in post has, has highlighted just the multitude of, of, of challenges that are, that are facing our health and social care system in Northern Ireland. They're not unique challenges to Northern Ireland. They're challenges that are faced by um, states, countries, nations right around the world. Um, but the one thing that I am going to prioritise in my, my time in office, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, is, is what I said in response to uh, the chair of the committee previously, is that, that need for, for transformation and reform and change within our health and social care system. Uh, and I know that, and, and we've just had a discussion around statutory care homes, that sometimes um, talk of change can be frightening for many, and, and people have uh, emotional attachments to uh, facilities. And that's understandable. I have many of them myself. I'm sure everybody here does as well. But what I want to uh, move on uh, in the time that I have in office is the need to transform our health service. And, and having read Sir Liam Donaldson's report, and indeed comments made by the Chief Medical Officer today, it's very, very clear that Northern Ireland is, has the capacity to have a world-class health and social care service. In many respects, when we were talking previously about uh, coronary care, which is a, a really good example of where we do have a world-class specialist service. There are other examples as well. So we, we, are, we are very, very good in many respects, but I want us to be good in everything. I want us to be world-class. Um, we need change uh, to achieve that. But what I, the point that I would want to make uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, is that whilst we face change, and change is inevitable within our health and social care sector, it must always be change for the better. Uh, and that's what uh, I wanted to lead on uh, and to ensure it becomes a reality during my time in office and beyond. I call Mr. Douglas for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And just following on that, that theme in terms of challenges, um, what impact will the failure to implement the Stormont House Agreement have on your health budget? Mr. Um, Principal Deputy Speaker, an issue that was uh, sort of teased out a little bit in, in, in response to, to Mr. Boylan, but um, it, is, it, is, it is not having a, an effect on this year's budget yet, because a budget is in place and all departments are, are operating to the budget that is there. However, that budget, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, unravels very quickly. If the finances and flexibilities that flowed from the Storm and House agreement, agreement aren't secure, so the House will probably be most familiar with the £200 million for the voluntary exit scheme. So my department, like many departments, is relying on making pay bill, pay bill savings in year because of uh, the use of that £200 million to let some people uh, uh, exit the system early. Um, if that doesn't happen, then we are into a crisis situation, not just in my department's budget, but, but every executive minister's department. Where it is having uh, an impact, or one could argue that it has had an impact, is in the fact that we are losing 9.5 million, needlessly losing 9.5 million pounds each and every month because of our failure to move forward on welfare reform. So we continue, and I think sometimes we have glossed over or, or sort of forgotten the particular impact of the, this, this loss of 114 million pounds this year, which is a total fine, uh, and the 100 million pounds that has been lost to date. That £9.5 million a month, if that was received by, by my department, um, Deputy Speaker, that would be equivalent. Uh, that would allow me to, pro to help to provide 1,800 hip operations, uh, 2,100 knee operations. It's the equivalent of 900,000, the cost of 900,000 prescription items. It would pay for 264,000 GP consultations, 16,000 weeks of nursing home care, and 233,000 physiotherapy treatments. So whenever I hear some argue, as I do in this place and in the media, that by resisting welfare reform, by incurring these penalties, they are helping the needy and the vulnerable in Northern Ireland. There are no more needy or vulnerable people than those who are on the waiting list looking for hip operations, for knee operations, who That's need minister, nursing home care conclusion. and who need physiotherapy treatment. Call Mr Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker and Minister. Can I ask uh, what action is being taken to reduce uh, domestic accidents and improve home safety? Mr. Um, Mr. Principal, let me speak. In, in February of this year, my department launched a new 10-year strategy for, 
home accident prevention. The strategy's vision is that the, the population of Northern Ireland has a, the best chance of living safely in the home environment where there is negligible, neg negligible risk of unintentional injury. The strategy sets out four main objectives, which I will share with the House, um, each of which is supported by a set of strategic priorities. The four objectives are empowering people to better understand the risks and make safe choices to ensure a safe home with negligible risk of unintentional injury, to promote safer home environments, to promote and facilitate effective training skills, knowledge in home accident prevention across all relevant uh, organisations and groups, and to improve our evidence base. Time is up. Uh, we must now 